Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have an early impression video on a discontinued masculine fragrance. But before we get into that, I want to say very happy Mother's Day to all the moms watching. I um, know that most of my patrons that sort of uh, watch me get on here and, and ramble nonstop about perfume are men. Uh, however, I have a pretty uh, respectable size of the audience that is women. And uh, so, happy Mother's Day to you if you are if you are mothers. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. Um, and you know, today I was thinking about doing a Mother's Day list, and then I thought, you know what? I um, decided that I wanted to talk about a fragrance that I've sort of been putzing around with. I've been playing with, uh, spraying it on before going to bed and stuff like that. Uh, and that is this little bad boy. It's a fragrance from the house of Montana, and it's called Camor. Camor EDT. And um, Camor EDT came out in 2004, um, and of course it's issued by the very precious House of Claude Montana. And um, I have to give a special shout out to Keith. If you know his uh, handwriting, you know that uh, this is a Keith Manly Sense sample that he sent me. And full disclosure, before I even go any further, I want you guys to know that this caused me to buy a bottle. So I will be getting a bottle of this, it's on the way. Um, and this is, um, a fragrance that, uh, while some may consider it, um, mediocre at best, I had an amazing time getting to know this and, and wearing it and enjoying it. But before we get into the fragrance, let's talk a little bit about the House of Montana, because most people, um, in, in Fragcom, whenever you talk about the House of Claude Montana, there's a couple of fragrances that come up. The most popular for men is this. You've probably seen this Tower of Babel looking bottle. Um, and this is called Montana Parfum Dome. And Montana Parfum Dome came out in the late 80s. Uh, it is a fantastic um, leathery sort of... Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's green, it's leathery. It's, it's the best fragrance from the House of Montana, hands down. And I will do a full review on this one day very soon. I've got multiple bottles. I actually have three bottles of this stuff. I love it so much. Uh, and the other fragrance that you tend to sort of hear about in Fragcom is, is this. It's a cheapie, and it's called Graphite from the House of Montana. I have um, been on this bandwagon for a while. If you follow the channel, you'll know I sort of talk about this fragrance sometimes when I talk about cheapies. I did a this is not a top 10, you know, cheapy video, and this made the list, and uh, I, I do think still, even to this day, you can get a 100 mil bottle for 30 or 40 bucks. It's uh, pure steel at that price. Uh, it's a Nathalie Lorson, and if you know her style, you'll sense it in here. You'll sense her style in uh, in graphite. Um, it's, a, it's a great fragrance. I'll do a, a full review one day on it, because I have not done a full review. Just sort of talked about it in passing, but those are the two Montana fragrances that really get talked about. And what's interesting is a lot of people don't really know the backstory of Claude Montana. So Claude Montana, um, as a man and sort of as a house, uh, he went through some dark times. He rose to prominence in the 19, late 70s, um, early 80s. Some of the um, some of the folks that sort of um, put some of the big designers on the scene, um, you know, the folks that worked with Giorgio Armani and stuff like that, thought he was going to be like the next big designer that would be around forever. And in the 80s, he was, you know, he was huge. He was, uh, he was sort of um, um, seen as like a savant, as a savant in the, in the designer, in the designer crowd. He caught fire, literally caught fire, um, dressing the most influential people, um, you know, uh, people like, um, oh, Alexander McQueen and Clay and Cher and uh, Ricardo uh, Tiski and Olivier uh, Thayskins and all of these very talented, uh, influential people. And uh, he was influencing them with his designs. And so, long story short, is he ended up um, going through bankruptcy. So, in the span of 15 years or so, he went through bankruptcy, drugs, and the suicide of his uh, first American wife um, and, and muse basically turned him into a bit of a recluse. He turned into a bit of a Howard Hughes, and he just went into hiding, if you will. Nobody could reach him. He was unavailable. You know, even though he was a big fashion house, he was a big fashion mogul, you know, he was a star, sort of. Um, he, he almost lived like, if you've ever seen the movie Walk the Line, where Johnny Cash 
is sort of living in his friend's house, drinking old stale beer. He's got like a $50,000 check that the bank wouldn't cash right then, and he just like rips it up because it's not good to him right then and there. You know, that's the way that it felt like to me Claude Montana was living. And then he made a little bit of a comeback. Uh, after the 90s, which was a very rough decade on him, this is sort of, I think of this as like the peak of Claude Montana's career, that literally this is like, um, this is him reaching the top of the tower in 1989, and then he just, instead of going back down, he just jumped right off. And they had a very tough time um, just kind of surviving, I would say, in the, in the 90s. Uh, again, the tragedy with his wife and, and all of the stuff that ended up happening, um, he just sort of he just sort of turned turned into himself and, and got out of the public eye. And everyone thought that that was it. He was sort of done. Uh, and then he made a little bit of a comeback in the early 2000s uh, and even into this last decade, 2010 to 2020, Claude Montana and his house have continued to sort of grow again. And so from the ashes, so to speak, you know, he, he rose again. And so um, this is one such fragrance that I associate with his rebirth. And I know fragrances in the fashion world are sometimes two different trajectories, right? What's going on on the, on the catwalk, on the runway, and what's going on in the fragrance world. Many of these um, fashion houses sort of view the fragrance world as like, you know, it's like a small little piece of the business that har hardly anyone even pays attention to it. Karl Lagerfeld famously had zero input in the fragrance world. He was an icon at Chanel, right? But he he knew, he touched, he did nothing with the fragrances. Um, and so that just goes to show how some of these creative directors, designers, you know, um, the people who run these big houses think of what's going on in the fragrance world. But I think of this fragrance, Camor, as sort of a comeback, if you will, for the house of Claude Montana, uh, from a dark period into something new and optimistic and forward-looking. That's the way that that's the way that I view it, anyways. And so this fragrance, uh, interestingly enough, if you go to Base Notes and you type in the fragrance and you look it up from 2004, there's a little blurb what pops up right above the triangle, the note listing, and it says part of a range of youthful scents by Montana, each inspired by islands. The three scents, Samar, uh, Malaysia, and Camor, are all packaged in the same bottles, but with different coloring. Okay, so basically there are um, three islands that um, uh, that these are sort of um, uh, not necessarily giving reference to, but named after. And I don't know how much of the islands actually come into play in the smell. I've never been to Comoros. Comoros is actually an island uh, off the, in between sort of the um, uh, East African coast and Madagascar. So if you take Madagascar and you just go, like you're moving from Madagascar northwest up to the African coastline, you would run into this little island chain. And Comoros is one of those. It's actually the union of Comoros officially now. It's its own independent country, um, and so I have no clue if there's bits and pieces of the history of the island of Comoros, or if they just kind of did it as a cool little marketing ploy, uh, but either way, that is technically where the name comes from, okay? So, um, interestingly enough, uh, while all of these other fragrance channel houses, uh, all, of these other, all of these other YouTube fragrance channels are getting their free bottles of Roja Dove Elysium O intense which is his new release and it's just like ah. um you know oh intense god uh how the mighty have fallen but um while they're all putting out their new free bottle videos for roja's oh intense by from elysium um i'm doing a video on a fragrance that no one talks about there are actually zero youtube videos on this zero which blows my mind it's absolutely un i mean just in the last couple months, I've probably done five of these where there are no YouTube videos on the channel on the fragrance at all, which really makes me um, feel like I'm doing a service, a very important service. Like I'm doing, I'm like I'm being called to do something uh, worthwhile for the community. You know, like I'm really pitching in. I think of Fragcom as like a well, and you can either take from it or you can add to it. And I really want to add as much as I can to Fragcom. Uh, I think it's very important. I just imagine some kid, you know, years in the future, getting a bottle of Camor, Camor or stumbling across it and um, 
you know, going on the internet and looking it up and there be no vid and there were no videos, nothing on, on the fragrance for him to, to watch other than reading some of the quick reviews on, you know, Parfumo or, or Base Notes or something like that. But I want there to be a video for people that, that want to watch it, that want to watch it. And the other part is, you know, the world can be, I think, a really tough place sometimes. And um, it can be harsh, it can be cruel. That's just life. Life is unfair, period. But sometimes I think people want to tune into something like this and see a smiling face, see a real person talking back to them, not some channel that's trying to sell them dish soap. Or, you know, you know and, I, and I've seen fragrance channels try to sell friends razors and dish soap and all kind of crazy shit. Um, I, I have been approached by so many brands trying to send me stuff and I haven't done videos on any of them yet. Um, you know, I had I had I had a brand reach out and and try to send me a solid so a solid cologne, and I've just completely ignored them. I've had brands reach out, and you know, um, some of the clone houses reach out, completely ignored them. And so I um I uh, I'm I'm trying to stick to what I feel is true, the kind of videos that I want to do, but I also want to make it enjoyable for you. I want you to be able to. Uh, when you're watching these videos, I want you to also sort of have that human interaction, which I feel like we're missing, we're, we're losing more and more of that. Even though I'm talking to you through a screen, I really feel like I'm sort of communicating with a friend. That's my style anyways, right? And um, that's that's sort of important to me. But um, this is discontinued, okay? So a couple things that I, I, I'm going to tell you right off the bat. Even though I told you I really like this and I went and bought a bottle, don't pay big money for it. I don't think it's a fragrance that's worth hundreds, okay? It's not. Um, maybe if you can get 100 mils for under 100 bucks or something, or 75, or uh, in full disclosure, I got my 100 mil bottle for 50 bucks shipped. Um, that's a very fair price for me, especially with what the, with the crap they're putting out nowadays. 50 bucks for 100 mils of this, this, it's my speed all the way, right? But don't pay big money for it. It's not worth hundreds. Um, so, so like I said, very brave release from the House of Montana. No way in a million years. So when I first smelled this, and again, I've worn it to bed a couple times. Um, and today it's actually my scent of the day uh, for Mother's Day. And it's a little past 1230. I've had it on for about four and a half hours now on my skin. And um, basically, no way in hell would I have guessed that this is a 2004 release. Absolutely no way. If I had no clue, if I was blindfolded, if I was smelling this in a blind uh, situation, I would have guessed this is an 80s fragrance. 80s, all the way. It's There's no question about it. It's an 80s fragrance in my mind. Uh, it feels like it was released, you know, right dab, dab smack in the heart of the, of the 1980s. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, this is a green 80s fougere, right? If I was blindfolded, that's what I would think. And so, very shocking that this is a 2004 release. That's why I say it's such a brave release from the House of Montana. And the fact that when you read the little blurb on um, part on Base Notes, for example, part of a range of youthful scents, um, the fact that they were trying to, you know, market this as youthful is pretty humorous to me because it does come across as very vintage um, smelling to my nose from what I know about, let's say, uh, fragrance styles throughout the decade. So the fact they were trying to market this as useful in 2004, no wonder it failed and flopped in sales and no one bought it. So that's that's number one. But um, what you end up getting, obviously it's a green fougere. So um, what 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 started in the fougere in the fougere world, what basically started with a very tiny pinch of dihydromersinol in Paco Rabanne Pour Homme, turned into just them dumping bucket loads of dihydromersinol in things like um, Dracar Noir or in things like Lomani Porom. And there's many others from the 80s that you could sort of reach out that had tons and tons of dihydromersinol. Creed's uh, Green, I'm sorry, uh, Green Irish Tweed had a bunch of dihydromersinol. Um, cool Water had a bunch of it. That, that sort of thing, right? That, that fresh vibe that comes from it. And um, the 80s were just loaded with dihydromersinol scents. The reason Camor instantly reminds of the 80s style is it is a fougere, obviously. Um, and you get this extremely aromatic, very fresh take on lavender. Not a deep, dark, herbal lavender like you get in, you know, something like Caron's Pour or something like that. No, this is a very um, aromatic 
very fresh take on lavender and it mixes with that dihydromersinol freshness and it comes across as it does come across as synthetically prepared okay so that synthetically prepared aspect of the scent is why i think some of the people who have left reviews on the scent have been a little bit harsh on it um and but but i'll get to i'll get to my my uh counterpoint to that here in a little bit um but the dihydromersinol freshness and the aromatic lavender that comes together as sort of synthetically prepared. Um, it's interesting because it may be off-putting to some, but to me, it's actually very attractive. Um, many of the points that some people make against the fragrance are things that I actually really like about it. And again, I am the fish that goes upstream. I go the other way uh, all the time. Almost, I, I, you know, I'm a non-conformist to the, to the max. Um, I love going against the grain. I love doing my own thing. If everyone's running this way, I'm instantly asking myself why and why aren't I going that way, right? I want to go where the people are not going. Um, that's my, that's my personality. I am a contrarian through and through, and I just can't help myself. I just have to live with that fact. That's who I am. Um, and you know, it's, uh, what's interesting about this perfume is, so Many can pick it apart and say things like, you know, it smells synthetic here or there. Uh, qualities that they are sort of bashing are qualities that endear the fragrance to me. And uh, instead of putting me off, I end up liking the fragrance even more. So when you look at the note listing from the eyes of a vintage lover, a couple of things are going to jump out to you first and foremost. So number one is that uh, the note listing is coriander and lemon in the top, hazelnut, lavender, and rosemary in the heart with cypress as a base and that's it cypress and musk are the, are the two base notes and they're and they're and they're spot on uh it's a spot on note listing base notes does not list the hazelnut uh fragrantica and parfumo do list the hazelnut just in the spirit of full disclosure okay so when you look at that from the eyes of a vintage lover uh you're gonna see one big red flag and that is the hazelnut and one thing i can confirm is this hazelnut doesn't give off this um, strong, sharp, nutty smell. I actually do not like hazelnut, okay? I'll tell you that right now from the get-go. One of my most hated things on this earth is hazelnut coffee. I cannot stand it. It literally makes my skin crawl. Um, and so this does not give off this hazelnutty, sharp, um, strong, nutty smell. It doesn't have that at all. So that's, at least you can put that to the positive side. If that hazelnut note sort of uh, when you look at this is the thing that puts you off, you can, you can glance right past it. Okay. Uh, cause that is a big red flag. I would say for me, when I first saw the note listing, I was like, Ooh, hazelnut. I bet you that's going to be gross. It's not. Um, and instead it just sort of adds this, um, I don't know, this like creaminess, I guess you could say to it. There's just like this creaminess that it adds to the fragrance. And I would doubt that you could even pick out hazelnut if no one told you. If no one said, hey, there's hazelnut in this fragrance, I, I doubt you would even be able to pick it out. So where I tend to pick it up more actually is in the dry down, believe it or not. I tend to get this sort of musky sweetness that tends to come out in the dry down. And I'm guessing that, again, it could be uh, construed as sort of cheap, synthetic, boring. But even with the touch of sweet hazelnut and musk in the base of the dry down, I quite like it. And um, now, so let's get to the star of the show because there is definitely a star of the show for me. And the star of the show is in between the opening and the dry down. And that is this Cypress note. Um, and actually it's a couple of things, but let's talk about the coriander first since coriander is in the top. So you get uh, coriander and you get nutmeg. And um, the coriander come acro comes across in this fragrance is very toasty. So imagine like toasty coriander, which is very arid and dry, extremely dry coriander. And it's it sort of coriander can have multiple facets, but one half of coriander can come across smelling sort of citrusy and soapy. And the other half can come across as smelling warmer and spicy. OK, and it's usually the warmer, spicy elements that you get when excuse me, you taste it in food. And it's actually normally blended with warmer spicy notes because that's what they mix well with. So in food, you'll see coriander mixed in with something like cumin or cinnamon or something like that. Other warm spicy note profiles, let's say, okay? And this is a very parched, toasted coriander seed blended with this very underutilized note 
the star of the show, for me, one of the stars of the show is Cyprus. And I absolutely love the note of Cyprus. Um, to me, Cyprus has this very medicinal healing property to it almost. Um, sometimes it can smell very woody and sometimes it can smell smoky. Sometimes it can smell sort of uh, dry, green, um, earthy, sometimes almost like winter green. Like imagine like pine trees or cypress trees in the, the dark, in the deep, darkest depths of winter. And I want you to imagine sort of this uh, winter green quality that the air smells like if you're standing around the trees in the cold, you know, when you can see your breath, right? That's the sort of image that sometimes cypress trees give me. Um, but they differ from pine trees in that cypress has this slightly sweet undertone, very slightly sweet, not modern, synthetic, disgusting sweetness, none of that. Um, not caramel sweetness, uh, not bubblegum sweetness, none of that stuff. Um, it just has this very sweet under, very uh, uh, sweet undertone, I would say. And when blended with this musky base, it sort of um, presents this brilliant modern masculine to me. Now, I say modern because this is a modern masculine. It came out in 2004, uh, but it has a big throwback vibe because, again, you close your eyes, you're smelling something from the 80s. And um, some of the fragrances that also came out later in the 80s that were influenced by, you know, the big dose of the hydromersinol and stuff like this is there's a couple fragrances that I'll just mention real quick. One is called Caesar's Man. And Caesar's Man, if you can get the older ones that say Legendary Cologne Spray, oh my God. I don't know if, um, I don't know how truly to date these bottles. All I know is that I got this from, um, I got this from my buddy Six, and I was blown away by this. Some people don't like this style, but I actually really do. It's grown on me, this 80s style. I know exactly what it is. I understand where it sits in history of, of perfume now. And uh, I, I don't hate it. I actually really like it. And I like wearing those type of fragrances in summer. And many might think, wow, you wear stuff like that in summer? Absolutely, because that dihydromersinol green sort of fougere freshness um, is very attractive in the heat to me. And that's the type of fragrance this is. Camor, when this arrives in my collection, this is going to be a spring-summer fragrance. This is not a winter fragrance for me. In the winter, I like wearing the thicker, heavier scents. I mean, I'd, I'd wear these two in winter, let's say. These two are, are, are colder weather scents for me, but, um, you know, the fougeres, even stuff like Enrico Coveri Por Homme, um, there's, there's a, a, a little bit of, of Camor in Enrico Coveri Por Homme, and um, even like the reference fougere many people mention, Gucci Nobile, there's just a little bit of that green, you know, it's, it's there. It's definitely there. Now, I've heard some people make uh, reference to something like Coriolan, which even though this came out in the 90s, this is a very interesting fragrance in that it doesn't remind me of, sm the smell doesn't remind me of, of Camor as much as Coriolan, but the, but the fact that this is a fragrance that was released in the late 90s, but started construction in the early 80s by Jean-Paul Jean Guerlain whenever he began working on the uh, Centurion project, which was Derby and Coriolan. They ended up coming together. Coriolan was a Roman general, um, I uh, go read the history on him. He uh, is a very interesting character, but he sort of ended up turning on his government and um, and declaring war against them, basically. So they had a civil war. Um, but it was interesting that Jean-Paul Guerlain cre created a fragrance called Coriolan, while LVMH was sort of, you know, taking over. It was like him declaring war on LVMH, I think subconsciously, or maybe not even subconsciously, maybe directly. Um, but so the smell doesn't really remind me as much here as here. I don't think necessarily these, I think this is more of a citrusy aromatic chipra. I think this is more of a fougere. I don't think there's much of a connection between the two, but I think there is a connection in the fact that this is a fragrance released out of its time and it completely flopped. And this is a great fragrance. They re-released it later on in the L'Art and Le Matier collection, whatever it's called, uh, as Lame Dune Eros or the Soul of a Hero or something like that. And, um, you know, I, I, th I have a comparison video on my channel. If you want to go check that out, you can. But the fact that these two were both sort of released out of their own time, out of their element, and they just flopped because of that, um, 
you know, I think that's the connection between the two more so than the smells. And a newer bottle in my collection that I really like that also falls into this greenish, you can almost see the juice color, right? You know, this green sort of 80s freshness. This is a little bit fruitier because it's a Pierre Bourdon. He loved mixing in those fruity notes. He ended up teaching his pupil later on, uh, Jean-Christophe Harreau, about the fruity oh, pineapple opening. And he ended up using that in Aventus, the big the big hit of, of, 20, of 2010. One of the most influential niche fragrances ever. I love Aventus. Um, and I'm not one to shy away from a fragrance just because it became popular. No, I, um, I love, I love uh, fragrances like, like Aventus. I have no problem saying I love Aventus. Um, but it, it's just interesting because this has a very similar, you know, maybe spine, backbone, but then you can, you know, play with the, um, what's, what's sort of hanging on the tree, if you want to go with that metaphor. Um, and Pierre Bourdon chose to hang more fruity notes and stuff like that on this tree, but they all sort of share this 80s DNA. And so does Camorra. That's the thing, is Camorra shares this 80s DNA. Um, and when you read the notes, um, and you read reviews, you're going to get this, oh, this is, this is cheap. This is two, you know, this is 2004. All the great materials were already banned by then. So it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's nothing special about this and, and all that rolled around and it was, it was restricted by 2004. So this really isn't a special fragrance. And to that, I say, not every fragrance has to be a Michelangelo. Not every fragrance has to be a masterpiece to be enjoyed. Um, to, it doesn't have to be a work of art for you to appreciate it and wear it and enjoy it. And, um, you know, this is one of those fragrances that, that's just an enjoying, calming, um, fragrance that just sort of speaks to me. It speaks my name. Uh, it, it, uh, it plays in the sandbox that I like to play in. We talk the same language, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it speaks Ram and, and I can speak right back. Uh, and so for me, that's why I ended up buying this. This is a bold, bright, you know, if Chris from Scentland was, re was reviewing this fragrance, what would he say? He would say, this is a very bold, brave release by the house of uh, Montana. Uh, and he would say, it's a very uplifting fragrance. It doesn't sit on your shoulders and weigh you down. He would be spot on. That's exactly what this is. This is an uplifting, um, optimistic fragrance for the future that harkens to the past. And I love these type of fragrances. So whether the note listing is, you know, uh, rock star note listings or whatever the quality of the ingredients are. I don't really care. The overall blend creates something that I absolutely love and um, I'm a big fan. So thank you to Keith for sharing. Uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know this. I, I enjoyed it so much. I ended up buying a bottle, which I did not think I would, but um, for, especially when I saw 2004, I was like, what the hell, Keith? Uh, and as soon as I sprayed it, I was like, okay, I completely understand. 100% completely understand. So thanks to everyone for watching. If you have experience with this by any chance by the House of Montana, uh, do let me know. I would love to hear your thoughts and uh, leave a comment. I do try to uh, get with get back with uh, every single person who subscribes. We're still small enough. I can respond to every single comment and I do. I love the back and forth. I love the interaction. Uh, I appreciate the support. It is. Uh, it means more to me than you guys could know. I mean, whenever I get down, I read some of the comments. You know, every every time it just lifts me up. It just um, it just lifts me up to continue doing these videos because there is a hole. There's a need for this. There's a need for people to step forth and do these type of videos that no one else is talking about. So while everyone else is doing their you know most recent Roja flanker of Elysium video. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about a discontinued masculine from 2004, and that's exactly how I want it to be. So, hope you guys have enjoyed this video. We kept it under 30 minutes. Cheers, guys, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.